In this video, we're going to talk a little bit about cash flow and, and some of the importance of how we uh, uh, utilize this uh, variable uh, to determine the, the wealth or the value of a company's stock. So the three aspects of cash flows that affect value, one is the actual cash flow expectation. The bigger the cash flows you expect, the greater the value. In addition, the timing of the cash flow stream is extremely important. The sooner you can get money from a project, the more value you'll be bringing to the company. And of course, in the end, the riskiness of the cash flows is extremely important. The, as, as projects become less risky, or less risky projects tend to have higher values than higher risk projects. So again, these three aspects affect the value of the company because they affect cash flow. The most important definition, and there are some other definitions uh, throughout the, the videos, but uh, for this particular uh, uh, chapter, we're talking about something called the free cash flow. Now, free cash flows are the cash flows that are available to distribute to investors. So who are the investors of the corporation? Well, there's two sets. There's the shareholders, of course, but we also don't want to forget about the creditors. Creditors, even though we don't think of them like this, creditors are also... Um, investors in our company. They give us money. They expect something in return. Stockholders buy our stock. They give us money. They expect something in return. So the basic formula is you take the sales revenues of the company, and you subtract out their operating costs, subtract out operating taxes, and subtract out any required investment in operating capital. So what free cash flow is, is after you've paid all the bills, invested in all the working capital, um, invested in fixed investments, intangible investments like other companies or the stocks of other companies, this is the amount of fund that's available to distribution to investors. So what will they receive from us? Well, if they're a shareholder, we're either going to pay them a dividend or we're going to buy back their stock. If they are a bondholder, we are either going to pay them interest or we're going to pay off the loan. Those are the free cash flows associated going to the investors. Now, of course, the cash flows coming to us would be if the uh, investors bought stock from us or if they bought bonds from us. so But this free cash flow, again, just reflects money that's left over to pay off our investors. And of course, investors are very interested. They'd rather have more free cash flow than less because it makes their investment uh, less risky. <clears throat> The weighted average cost of capital is a number that essentially tells us about the rate of return that's required by investors. So if you want to invest in a company, what is it that you expect in returns? And again, I just mentioned this a second ago. If you buy a bond, you expect interest and a payment payback of the loan. If you buy stocks, you expect dividends and a future stock price. Those are the expectations for you. Now, as the company becomes riskier, you want to get paid more. We're going to talk about this in some later videos. It's called the risk return trade-off. So think about a corporation, right? As the company becomes riskier, the cost of financing increases, which means the return to investors 
increases. So as companies go up in risk, they typically will have increasing finance costs because of the riskiness of the company. And here we see what they refer to as the big picture, right? But here's ultimately how we find the value of the firm. Here's free cash flows. We have to predict what those are. Here are the components we've talked about. And then we have to think about the weighted average cost of capital. There are only two sources of financing uh, long-term for the company, debt and equity. So we need to understand something about interest rates, risk aversion for the, for the stock market, the company's business risk, the debt equity mix, right? So the intrinsic value, right? It's the sum of all of the future expected free cash flows when Kurt converted into today's dollars, right? The time value of money, utilizing the weighted average cost of capital as the discount rate in our uh, time value calculation. And I'm sure you've heard of this many times in other classes, right? But we have savers and borrowers, right? But we want to talk about net. They say that households are net savers. That is, households typically have more money than they need on average. Now, that's not every household, but in general, households have extra money. They can save money. Non-financial corporations, right, businesses, are net users, right? They're borrowers. They typically never have enough money in order to um, buy the things that they need. So they are typically net borrowers. Now, the governments are net borrowers. The U.S. government is. but some foreign governments are net savers. In general, let's think about the United States government. We are definitely net borrowers. We spend far more money than we bring in from taxation. Financial corporations, it's a toss up, right? Uh, they could be net borrowers, but it's really a little bit more of a trade-off uh, between the two that they almost break even as to whether they want to save or borrow money. Now, what happens here is we have, how does money get to savers? Or how does business get money, right? We can do something called a direct transfer. This is where the money directly transfers from savers to business. Very difficult, very cumbersome, right? I mean, if you needed a lot of money, this would be very difficult to do. I think if you needed a, a million dollars, you know, where would you go to talk to individual savers to get a million dollars? The way it's done that's a little more convenient, a little bit more efficient, is we do it either going through an investment bank and issuing securities, or we go through a financial intermediary. Now, in an investment bank process, we are issuing the company's securities. So we have securities, we create securities, we give them to the investment bank, and they sell those to savers. So the savers' money finds its way back to the business. On the other hand, in a financial intermediary, Typically, the security that they are selling, they are selling their own securities. They sell securities, then the dollars, again, flow back through to the business. So this is what we refer to as the capital allocation process. So let's think about interest in general, right? We know that it's the price or the cost of money, right? So what do we call the price of equity capital? Well, the cost of equity or its required return has two parts. It has the dividend yield, 
and it has capital gains. And we'll see when we get through some a variety of other videos how we utilize this breakdown to develop the value uh, of the company and understanding of how much return we should expect, etc. But the cost of money is a function of several factors. What are the production opportunities of the company? The more opportunities you have, the greater demand there is for money, which means the cost of financing goes up. Time preferences for consumption. You would rather consume now than delay to a later date. So how do we get you to delay? We have to pay you more. So the cost of financing goes up. Risk, we know that as things become riskier, the, the required return or the cost of those funds is going to go up. And indeed, in the end, inflation is a piece of return. So it's a piece of the expected costs of money for the company. So what kind of economic conditions are going to affect the cost of money? And most of these things are driven, at least out of the first two, are driven by the government and uh, uh, um, the Federal Reserve, right? So the Federal Reserve has techniques and tools that they use to help control uh, inflation. The federal government runs deficits and or surpluses. We haven't seen a surplus for a long time. So when you're running a deficit, it means there is a demand for money. And if there's a demand for money, that means then that there is uh, pressure for interest rates or the cost of money to increase. Again, the level of business activity will be important. This is all driven by supply and demand. So in a boom, there's a great demand for money. So that means interest rates will have pressure to go up. And finally, if you think about international trade deficits and surpluses, if we have a surplus, that tends to, have to reduce the cost of the company or of the cost of money itself because we have surplus trade. And finally, just a real brief thing, just to kind of look at the kinds of securities that we'll be talking about in, in the company. We're primarily going to talk about debt. We'll spend a little bit of time with short-term financing or money market kinds of debt, but not a tremendous amount of money. We will introduce options and talk about financial options and how we can use those in the company. But as far as financing, the primary tools corporations use are bonds, and of course they use common stock. And all of these securities, they all have a cost, they all have a risk, right? They all have different levels of returns based on cash flow, opportunities, and risk. So that's it for this video. I look forward to talking to you in the next video.